virtual guided reading webinar. And this is going to be our final one. And we're focusing today on grades three to five. And our goal is still the same. So our goal is still thinking about how we can translate our instruction from a physical classroom into a virtual classroom. So not a lot on new techniques or practices, really just thinking about what we already know how to do well in the classroom, how to do that in the virtual classroom. And we'll have the same session flow as well. We'll do video observations, we'll name some key points, and then at the end we'll have some time for Q&A. Okay, so these are the, um, the resources that I was using with the two groups that I was teaching in grades three to five. So still the reference book, still Zoom. Now I'm using Kindle. So I'm going into there, I've purchased the book and I share my screen so that everybody can see the book there. I'm using any sort of snip tool because what we're doing is we're, you'll see that we'll snip the evidence and put it into the response rather than having a child have to write it out or say it every time. We're gonna keep using vocabulary words. In grades three to five, you can use everything. We, in Lifelong Readers, we have 80 vocabulary words. Now you can begin using all of them, feelings and traits. And then with one of the groups, you'll see that we are also using the chat feature in Zoom to put responses in and then also to revise responses. And then more curriculum resources. I'm using the anchor chart, mostly um, with the upper levels, it's the characters in depth, and then we pull out one thing that we're working on. So for example, today we're gonna be working on relationships with our higher leveled group. And so we put this uh, anchor chart up and we pull out the relationship anchor chart. As far as reading habits go, what is most important at these levels is the ability to skim. And so I'm doing skimming practice regularly with all of my groups in these grades. We're going to keep the um, language warm up, but we're going to really just focus on context clues because that is the higher priority. And then, of course, we're going to do the retell like we always do. Um, before we get into the videos, I just want to make a note on infusing vocabulary into all groups and all grades. So starting as early as kids are four and five years old and all the way through adulthood, vocabulary, especially expressive vocabulary. So we think about vocabulary in two ways, receptive and expressive. Receptive, we understand if we read it in the text or we hear somebody else use it, but we, we're, we don't know it well enough to use it in our own language. And then we have our expressive vocabulary, everything that we are comfortable using in our language without um, a lot of thought. In Lifelong Readers, we're focusing on expressive vocabulary and specifically K1 is feelings and 2-3 is traits. And the reason this is so important is that our students understand so much more than they can articulate because they're limited by their vocabulary. When we specifically teach them and give them a controlled practice using feelings and trait words, their responses shoot up. And I'll talk a little bit about this at the end, but we're making our distance learning uh, online portal open to every teacher anywhere and parents too, if they would like to use it. And this is a place where you'll find all the phonics oral drill cards. You probably won't need those much, but I would really recommend using the vocabulary with, you know, whether you use lifelong readers curriculum or another curriculum, and it's all there for you to share your screen. And um, we'll see some examples of that today. And I just wanna give one really small example about what infusing vocabulary does for children's understanding. So we're gonna see an original response here about a jar of dreams, a little girl who's 11, she's Japanese American and kids are bullying her and she's always hearing bad things about being Japanese. And so the question is, what is Rinko, the main character, what is Rinko's perspective on being Japanese? Here was the first response from one student. Rinko feels really bad about being Japanese. Other students bully her because she is Japanese, okay? That is completely correct. It's not very impressive, it's not very sophisticated. So what I did with this particular group, I said, friends, here are some vocabulary words that might be able to help you. And I ran through seven, eight, nine words and then gave everybody a chance to revise their responses. So same student, um, five minutes later, here's what he wrote. 
Rinko feels ashamed to be Japanese because the other students make her feel insecure by bullying and teasing her. And I know you can see it, but the, the difference in the level of the response is enormous. And the child had the same understanding the first time as he did the second time. He just didn't have the vocabulary to express it. And we're learning more and more at Lifelong Readers how important it is to give kids controlled opportunities to use the words. So we don't just, of course, we introduce them and read aloud or whatever whole, whole class context. But then we can't say, hey, here are all these words. Which one do you want to use? We have to narrow it. And for the youngest kids, we, you know, we give them just a few words and they're all going to work. By the time they get older, we can give them eight or ten words. Some work, some don't. And they have to do some of that critical thinking around the vocabulary. Same quick note for everyone who's joined us before on management. You can't do much managing over a screen. And the tips that I would give here, I would say don't try. You know, don't say, oh, my friend, I can't see you. I can't do this. It's going to slow down the pace. I would just rely on this. You make it as engaging as you possibly can. You keep the pacing even stronger than you would in a classroom. Um, kids' attention spans are shortened because they're not physically with you. And so you're going to give maybe a little bit less think time or you're going to give a student a think time, move forward and then circle back to that student. Mute and unmute. This is so important. There's going to be background noises. Different things are going to be going on. And so if you just unmute the student who's speaking and otherwise everybody else stays muted, you'll find that the group's going to flow more easily. And then very occasionally, you know, with Zoom, you have the power to turn somebody's video off for a couple minutes. And this doesn't have to be punitive at all. I was um, I'm working on a middle school group where there's two twins, Shane and Sean, and they're fantastic and they're hilarious. And they've been doing a great job sharing the screen, um, writing in the responses. And then Shane disagrees with Sean, um, but Sean was originally right. And so then Shane just basically body slams Sean, you know, playfully. And so I just, you know, turn the camera off. And then a couple of minutes I turn it back on and they're both sort of staring at the camera because they wondered where they went. And then they were ready to participate again. So completely fine. Turn it off, turn it on. Um, a quick note on planning. You're just going to want in front of you a high level view. You're going to want to know what about, you know, um, approximation of what the kid's accuracy is, what their rate is. That's going to help you, especially when you read on the screen, to really make sure that all kids are reading and not saying they're done early. And then you want a general sense of their comprehension so that you can be targeted as you call on students. This is not in depth in any way. This took me about an hour and a half. And I would use this for about four weeks, you know, or maybe five weeks. And then I'm just taking notes as I see them improve or as I see them not improve. And I think about how to adjust my instruction. But this is really all that I'm using. The tally is really important because for some reason over the screen, it's harder to remember who you've called on. And so I'm just tallying who I've called on and what I've called on them to do. So I called on this child for evidence. I called on this child to retell. Well, now let me switch it up and give this child a chance to find evidence and this child to retell. And so you'll just want to keep some note taking uh, form with you. OK, setting expectations in the virtual classroom. It's pretty basic, but you do have to teach kids to put their face in the middle of the box. Um, otherwise, literally all you can see um, are their eyes. You don't know what's going on. You can't see anything else. Um, you have to really tell them to speak up. It's a real it's killing your pacing. If you're saying, sweetheart, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Speak up, speak up. Um, and then you want to quickly teach whatever your evaluation for us. It's up, side, down and then a signal to build on. Now, with grades three, four, I use that with my middle school group. And you might be able to use it with some of your groups. I use the Zoom features. So Zoom has a thumbs up. Um, Zoom has a raise hand. Zoom has we use as a clap hand. It doesn't have a thumb down, but we use that for disagree. And if you can get kids using that, it's much faster. And they think it's great, even on like the 10th lesson that they've used it. They think it's great. Okay, let's do a quick overview of the reading groups. Okay, so we have one reading group that is working on a level in step 10, and they're going to read 
uh, Francine Poulet, I have no, how, no idea how to say that last name, Francine Poulet meets the ghost raccoon. And then we have a level R, and this, I, you know, I don't know what this would be, step 14 or something like this, um, but Afonis and Pinnell level R. So we have those two groups. So what I'd like to do is let's start with the step 10 level N group. And I'd just like to tell you what I'm able to get through in about a 45 minute lesson. So on day one, I was able to get into the comp intro where, you know, I tell them we're working on perspective and um, skimming. And then we go into reading chapter one and they're reading it on my screen. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but that's the method that I was teaching. And then they were able to do the retail and that was about 45 minutes. And then on day two, we did our comp intro again, but now our comp intro is like literally 30 seconds. Remember perspective, blah, 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 blah. Remember how to skim the text, blah, 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 blah. Okay, here we go. Um, we reread. So we reread chapter one and then we did the focus question. I think this is a nice flow. So people using the Lifelong Readers curriculum, you'll know usually all this happens in one day, sometimes two. I think you'll have to break it out into two days. And I want to talk a bit about rereading and why. So we have to understand why we're asking kids to reread. And there are different um, purposes for rereading. One purpose to reread is to pick up your rate and your fluency. Um, typically after you word solve words, unless there's a reading disability, you remember what those words are. So the reread is really about your rate and fluency. Um, that's one. And then the second one is around comprehension. So sometimes you reread to have a deeper level of comprehension. But what we have to make sure when we're asking kids to reread for a deeper level of comprehension is that a deeper level of comprehension is actually possible, that the text is rich enough that you would read it again and understand something new and fresh. Um, so from my perspective, I don't do a lot of rereading reading A to Z texts, even at some of these upper levels, even at the step nine level M, I don't think they're rich enough, maybe once in a while, but mostly they're pretty straightforward. And so I am, if we read the first half of the book, the next day we read the second half of the book. And it's perfectly okay if one day you retell and one day you do the focus question, but there's not a lot there. In almost all of the chapter books, there might be a few exceptions. Um, it's worth rereading. There's a lot of rich stuff there. And so asking kids to reread a chapter or a section once is totally good practice because they really will understand more on the second read. Okay. So as far as video, we are from this group, we're going to see the comp intro and then we're going to see the focus question. Now, I'm going to go ahead and put on YouTube the retail for this group, but it looks identical to the grade two retail we saw in the last webinar. But it's there if you want to take a look and see how it's facilitated with a chapter book instead of um, a reading A to Z book, because that, that is a difference. Otherwise, it's a similar process. Now, remember in the comp intro, the comp intro is really three things. Um, you're telling them their comprehension skill, whether it's perspective or motivation or theme. And at these levels, you're just saying it pretty quickly. And then the other is there's a reading habit. And I'm going to say skim the text is the most um, important reading habit from levels K and above. Um, no, actually it's not. The first one that's most important is actually monitoring your own comprehension, which is a step seven or six and really figuring out if you, you know what you read or if you got distracted. That is actually the prerequisite and what's most important. After that, it's skim the text. It is a skill um, we use as readers for the rest of our lives. And as soon as we can begin teaching kids and giving them isolated practice to skim the text, the better. So I'm going to go ahead and show this group, which is um, the step 10 level N group, learning and practicing how to skim. And then if anything strikes you as being effective, could you just put it in the chat and I'll share out the themes. And then if you're thinking of a way that you would adapt it, um, same thing, put it in the chat. Please go ahead and put the questions in the chat as well. Um, if I can answer them in the moment, I will. If I need some time to think, I'll make sure I get to them in the Q&A. Great, so let's go ahead into this video on skimming. Oh. 
you guys are all reading chapter books right now. And these chapter books have a lot of words on the page and they're getting longer and longer like that. And so when you are searching for evidence, you have to be able to skim, okay? And so when you're gonna skim something, and skim just means you look quickly from top to bottom. You don't go left to right to read, you go from the top all the way to the bottom. And it says, what word or phrase do I need to find? So you have to know what you're looking for. You have to know a word or a couple of words, and then you start at the top and you go down quickly with your eyes. As soon as you find it, then that's the part you need to reread, okay? So let's pray. I want you to find the place, the first place that you see um, that ghost raccoon, okay? Lance your eyes, don't read, just try and find. Okay, Jamila, I see you. Jamila, read what you found. I found um, perhaps this raccoon is a ghost raccoon. Good, and um, Jamila, how did you find that so quickly? Because I know you couldn't have read left to right the whole time. How did you find that? Um, I found that by skimming. Yeah, and from your eyes, were they going top to bottom or left to right? Top to bottom. Yeah, very good. So what every single person just did is they knew the phrase that they were looking for, and they were like top to bottom, searching, searching, no left to right, and then found it. And that's going to be really helpful because these books are longer and longer and longer. So you guys really did well. Um, a quick note, that is not the only way to teach how to skim. Um, but the biggest deal about teaching how to skim is trying to get them to realize you don't go left to right on every single line. So, I mean, you could teach them a zigzag method. You can teach them the up to down method. It doesn't really matter as long as they're really realizing you don't go left to right and that they begin to, um, they know what their keywords are. Um, great. So let me go ahead to the chat really quickly. If there's anything that you saw that was effective, go ahead and put it in there, anything you want to adapt. And then I'll get at some few questions while I see some other things. Um, Jasmine was asking, how do you know which vocab words to select? If you're using the Lifelong Readers curriculum, they're underlined in the retail, they're underlined in the focus question exemplar response. And so you can pull those. Um, but they might just be the feeling words. So you, you'll have to go into the traits. How I do it is I just read the book and then I, I go through the vocabulary words and I see which ones probably fit this book. Um, again, if you're using the curriculum, you can go to the vocab tab and a list of all the words is right there. And then for everyone else, you could just go into the distance learning icon and kind of quickly flip. I mean, it doesn't take much time at all and see which words you want to pull out. Again, you're going to be pulling from multiple decks. You might actually be pulling some words from kindergarten. You show those, and then you quickly go to the next step, deck. And then over time, you'll just start to remember which words are where and what will help. Um, Lauren, or Lauren, not sure, um, and Kathleen asked about the books. How do you get books to kids? Um, what resources do you have? I'm going to save that for the chat because I've kind of thought through some different resources, and I can share that. Um, the other piece is for these groups though, nobody got a book ahead of time. And so it's perfectly, it's, 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 um, what would I say? It's easy to facilitate even if kids don't have texts. And so it'll still work. Let me see about going into the chat for a second. Um, something that Angela was saying that it, it was effective was the pacing that you could really, you got this skill practice in really quickly. Um, and then Angela also asked how long would it take on day one to unroll it? Um, for us, that was day one. And it's very possible that work was also done. Those aren't specifically my students. So it's very possible that work was done um, in their school. I know the group that I had after this group, it's not a lifelong readers um, school. So they haven't had the curriculum and I taught it the exact same way and they picked it up really quickly. And I'm not worried about every kid getting practice every day. I'm not worried about us perfecting it because we'll spend two to three minutes every day practicing the skim and then they get really strong at the skill. 
Um, and then we also have Carice is pointing out that it's really helpful to highlight the text for everyone to see. Um, and then, uh, and just by highlighting that it's both engagement, but it's also showing the other kids how quickly you're able um, to, to skim, which is great. And the kids, I will tell you, I mentioned this, I think it was in our kindergarten session. If you watch Vox videos, they are, the content is absolutely incredible, but it's really interesting how they keep your attention when all they have is text. So they might put a huge legal document in front of you and then as they read an excerpt, they're highlighting it as they read or they bring a quote out and it's just the words on the screen. And so these things are good for instruction and they're really good for engagement. And great, let me see. Great, I think that kind of sums it up. I think Ebony is also similar to Carice's as well. All right, let's keep going. Go ahead here. Um, all right, let's go ahead and get right into the focus question. I'm going to add a question. So still what's effective and then also how would you like to adapt it for your own instruction? And I really in life and in instruction and in guided reading um, and mostly in life, we have to know how to struggle. Right. We, we really do. We it, kind of two pieces of the struggle. You got to learn how to be wrong. You just have to be wrong. All of us, we have to know how to be wrong and be wrong publicly. And then we have to not start crying or really getting frustrated when we don't get it right away. And you have to keep going and going. And these are values that you can instill in kids as, as young as kindergarten. And then this was something when I was a principal at Leadership Prep Canarsie in Brooklyn was really important to us. We talked about struggle and progress all the time in our with our five year olds, you know, the kindergartners. We said when you struggle, you work really hard, but you don't get it yet. It's not that you don't get it right. You don't get it yet. And that progress is when you do it better today than you did yesterday or you do better than you did right now in the past. And I can still remember with our founding cohort, you know, we started teaching those things early. And um, I remember that Fola, Fola looked at Summer and he said, he said, Summer, you're struggling and that is good. And, you know, then all of a sudden there was Fola was the first person to bring it out. And then all of a sudden kids were telling each other that all the time. And we just had a culture where nobody was afraid to be wrong and nobody was afraid to keep trying. And that is something that has to be explicitly taught. So I would encourage you also in the chat box, if you see anything, any any move or any technique where you feel like children are safe and affirmed and also comfortable with struggling, if you'd please type that in and then anything else you see that's effective. Let's go ahead and Character perspective. We talked about it yesterday. What a character believes to be true. Doesn't have to be true, but the character believes it is true, right? And so we're going to be asking ourselves that. What does the character believe to be true? And we have to find evidence. And this is our question for today. Mrs. Bissinger, or Mrs. B, tells Francine that there is a shimmery raccoon on her roof who calls her name. But Francine just says, write the address, okay? Okay, write the address. And so the question is, why does she say that? Why does she just go write the address? And you gotta think about what she believes, what she knows, um, something she realizes, something she understands. You gotta think about her perspective. So what we're gonna do today is, we are gonna reread the first chapter and the whole time you're trying to think about why she just says, Right, give me the address, give me the address, thinking about her perspective. Francine thinks it's no rat, no real raccoon on her roof. Okay, okay, Francine thinks there is no real raccoon on her roof. Great, you answered it, you answered the question, and now we're going to do the evidence a bit later. Okay, um, Tajay, go ahead. Thank you for your answer. Great, so I think there are some really great answers. Up here. I don't, it's not about if you agree, it's if they have a perspective in there, okay? So Jamila said, Francine thinks there is no real raccoon on her roof. 
Thumbs up if it has a perspective, thumbs down if it does not have a perspective. There is a perspective in here. How do you know? I know because when you just capture perspective, you have to think, you have to um, use what the capture is thinking inside their head. You just nailed it. Next one. Francine needs the address so that she can come. She can't help without the address. Is there a perspective in there? Why do you think a perspective is not in there? Why do I think a perspective is not in there? Because it's not showing what, what she believes. Mm, it's not showing what she believes. Okay, so let me come to you, Tajay. What do you think? Do you think it shows what she believes? Tajay, great job analyzing your own response. I just want to point this out. This is really important. Sometimes it's hard for us to analyze our own response and say, actually, no. And Tajay is really mature and in her mind, she's like, huh, no, I didn't include the perspective. Interestingly, Tajay, I agree with you. She does need the address to come and she can't help without the address. That is absolutely true, but we're trying to get her perspective, okay, on why she's just like, okay, okay, give me the address. So Tajay, think on that and I'll come back to you, okay, for your perspective. Okay, Tajay, um, you ready, sweetheart? Okay, go for it. Uh, Francine thinks that it's not really a ghost raccoon because she's probably thinking that it's, uh, not, um, it's not probably a real thing as a ghost raccoon. One and two. If you see evidence that you want to put in for your answer, all you do is give me that thumbs up and I will come to you for your, your evidence, okay? So skim it from top to bottom and see if it helps to prove your response on pages one and two. There might be evidence for you, there might not be evidence. There's a lot of pages. So go ahead and skim and see if you wanna add any evidence from here. Great evidence here, but Christopher, you saw some evidence. What do you like, sweetheart? First thing, have one manic, Trophies, 47, 47 of them to be exact. Great. So Christopher, look, look, look what I'm going to do. I am going to take your piece of evidence. Francine had one mini animal control 47 to be exact. I'm going to take your piece of evidence and I'm going to put it in your answer. Okay. So let me get that a little bit smaller so we can see. Okay. All right. Great. Okay, let's keep it moving. We're going to evaluate the evidence. Uh, Jamila, read it to me, please. It say, um, there are no ghosts, said Francine, and there are no ghosts of raccoons. Okay, so let me snip that for you, and go ahead and put it in your box. There are no ghosts and there are no ghosts of raccoons. And Jamila wants that piece of evidence, so we'll put that there. And we'll just make it a little bit smaller. There we go. Um, I see some people agreeing. Um, give me a thumbs up if you want that in your box too. Friends, you're doing amazing. So let's go in and let's evaluate our evidence. So what we do right now is each, each box, you have to ask yourself, does the evidence prove the inference? And so that's all I'm gonna ask right now is if there's evidence to prove the inference. So this is just thumbs up or basically thumbs down, I think we should be able to say. So for Jamila, here's her evidence. There are no ghosts and there are no ghosts of raccoons. A talking ghost raccoon? I don't think so. Does that evidence prove the perspective that Francine does not believe there is that a raccoon on her roof that can do all those things? And three thumbs ups. Okay, Jamila, you got evidence to prove it. All right, so here we go. Here are Jordan's answers. Perhaps you were not listening. This is not your average raccoon. There, and then another piece is, there are no ghosts and there are no ghosts of raccoons. Do those two pieces of evidence prove that Francine believes there is no ghost raccoon? She thinks it's a normal raccoon. <laughs> Thumbs up both pieces, thumbs to the side, one piece proves it, thumbs down, two pieces, they both don't prove it. Okay, uh, talk to us please, Christopher. 
Christopher thinks one piece proves it and one piece doesn't prove it. But wait, Christopher, don't go yet. Don't go yet. Um, Jordan, I want to ask you first. Um, how are you feeling about your answer? Are you feeling both pieces prove it, one piece proves it, or no pieces prove it? He's okay. Christopher saying both pieces. Christopher, you say, sorry, Jordan is saying both. Christopher saying, mm -mm, there's one that proves it and one that doesn't. Go ahead, Christopher. The one that proves it is, is there are no ghosts. There are no ghosts. And there are no ghosts of, of records. And the part that we don't lose is perhaps we're not losing. Okay, Christopher, let me summarize what he said. He said, this piece does not prove it. Perhaps you were not listening. This is not your average raccoon. It doesn't prove that Francine believes there's no such thing as a ghost raccoon. He says, but the second piece is really nice. It does prove that. So, Jamila, what do you think? I think one piece proves it because the pieces proving it is um the first piece or the second piece? The second piece. Okay, so you're on the same page with Christopher. Okay. The second piece proves it or the first piece proves it? I think it's the second. Okay, the second. So now let's go back to our friend Jordan. Jordan, what are you thinking? You've heard everybody really likes this piece of evidence, but they're not convinced on this. What do you think? I think I think I want to read back because it really it really doesn't show how she believes that it's not a real raccoon. You want me to get rid of it? Okay, Jordan, really nice, flexible thinking. Really just like Tajay, you listened to your friends and you said, okay, let me change this because you guys made it. So friends, let's talk about what we've done that's been so great. What we've done that's been so great is we started and we all got a great perspective down with thinks and beliefs. And then we found evidence, but we narrowed our evidence to the best evidence. Final thing I wanna to do today is see if any vocabulary words could make our answer stronger. I wanna focus here on uh, Christopher's, okay? So Francine thinks this is gonna be easy. Let's see if we can put in any kind of character trait um, to help us with her perspective about why. This is gonna if you think one of these will work, give me a thumbs up. If you don't think any of them work about Francine, thumbs down to help explain why she thinks it's gonna be easy. Bold, a person who is confident, courageous, willing to take risks. Fearless, a person who is not afraid to take risks or do something that's scary. Confident, a person who believes in his or her abilities. Arrogant, a person who thinks or acts like he or she is better than others. That's it. Okay, arrogant, confident, fearless, bold. Does anybody think those would fit? Anybody think those would fit? Um, Jamila, what do you think, sweetheart? Um, I think Fearless will describe Francine. So now the perspective is Francine thinks this is going to be easy because she is fearless and bold. What do you guys think? Thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up. Friends, you did such an incredible job. And we are. Okay, we have different thoughts in the chat box and some questions. So I'm gonna take it up to the top and here we go. So, sorry, scrolling up here. Having a little technological difficulty, okay. Mm, sorry, everyone. Let me see if I can actually, I'm having an issue. Um, I guess I'll go, yeah, I'll go like that. Okay, I got it. Um, let me start from the top. So, okay, I'm sorry guys, I'm really having a techn technological difficulty. Let me, I'm gonna try one more thing. Okay, I think that's gonna be better, yeah. Okay. Okay, great, I think I'm here. Okay, so the first question was, did you have them do this before the lesson, during the lesson? 
And did you see answers before the lesson? We did everything in the lesson. So we said the perspective piece, we said we're gonna reread, we're gonna think about this focus question with perspective and really think about the evidence you wanna use and what your answer is. So then we did that reread. And then I had everybody get their answers in their head. So I gave them specific you know, time and they gave me a thumbs up when they knew they had it. And then I had them go ahead and say it. So I didn't know what anybody was gonna say ahead of time. And then, great, and then that was from Shelby, and Shelby's also saying that it's really effective, a few things, to record their names by everything. One, kids just really like that. I think adults like to hear it. We like to hear our names as well. And then it just sets up for a conversation where they can speak to each other. And then um, Shelby was also pointing out that the SNP tool, a couple different people said the SNP tool was really effective and that um, Shelby has a shortcut for the SNP, so you don't have to search for it. So I'm gonna put that into the comments. And then the other thing is just some people, you know, we just have different levels of like comfort with technology, but we'll put um, a few more shortcuts. The, the Alt tab is really key as you facilitate this. When you hit Alt tab, you can switch between all your screens quickly. And then of course, just Control C for copy and Control V for paste. Those are the ones that I'm using all the time to keep this flowing smoothly. Let me go ahead and if I'm not gonna still have problems, let's see what else, there we go. Um, and then a couple people, a couple different people really pointed out that we're explicitly affirming children when they're able to change their own mind. And that's flexible and that's a wonderful thing. And so that's the affirmation on the struggle and then they become more comfortable with it. And let's see what else is here. Um, at these levels, are parents supporting at all? They're not. Um, at these levels, parents get them on. Some kids get themselves on, um, but uh, parents get them on typically, and then they're on their own. Um, and then, you know, just the most important thing is a quiet space, a flat place for your computer. And that's pretty much it. If you can have a or if they're using a tablet, you know, to sit it up uh, nicely. And then otherwise, the kids are on their own for the rest of the lesson. And then did you Kimberly's asking, did you pull those trait words specifically for this book ahead of time? Yes, I did. And um, even if you're using the decks, you just have to know which deck it's in and you can go quickly between them on the online portal. Um, we've found that using them on the online portal is even better than using them physically. At first I was using the physical cards, um, but they're better on the PowerPoint, it's quicker. And then, oh, I saw this. So um, Kathy is pointing out in, Denver that they're not allowed to use Zoom. New York City public schools aren't either because of privacy issues. Um, I don't have another platform off the top of my head, but if anybody else has an alternative to Zoom, could you please type it in and I'll make sure that it gets over to the public. And then Kathy, I'll keep thinking about that too. Um, oh, great. So I'm going to put over the shortcuts. Some people are putting shortcuts in on the next video. I'll put those into the public. Shortcuts are fantastic. Um, and then how many um, how many students are in each group? So I've run groups anywhere from four to ten and it works. Four to ten works. Um, with the 10, that's usually older kids. You know, it's hard to get 10 kindergartners because they don't, it, they lose attention. Um, so for kindergartners, I would cap it at seven, eight, maybe. Um, I think older kids, you can cap it at 10 or 12, um, especially so you can get more kids if they use the technology. So instead of doing thumbs up, thumbs down, they use their virtual thumbs up, they use your virtual hand, they use the chat box. Everybody stays engaged. People see each other's um, reactions. And the most I've had is 10. It worked really well. Um, but I think you could get it up to 12 and it would be still interactive, but only at these upper levels. Okay. And oh, great. So Jasmine said that Google Meets is an alternative. I, I did see that. There's actually, Kathy, this is good. Um, I'll get you this article. There was a New York Times article two days ago that was a big critique of Zoom based on privacy and we don't know what they're doing with our data because they haven't been explicit about it. Um, there's that statement that's like, um, if something's free, they're selling you, right? Um, so, but they had alternatives in there as well. So I'll get you, I'll email you that article. 
and great and yeah jasmine was pointing out google meets thank you for that and oh great um kathy said that's what they're using so fantastic okay and ebony was oh ebony great so she has lots of options i'm going to pull that over because i can see it now and i'll go ahead and pull over others as we go okay we'll keep it moving okay so we're switching reading groups now now we are going to go into a boy called bat again this is maybe it'd be step 14 or 15 but it's level r and i want to give you an overview of um, what i did with the group and so for most of our books at the step 11 and 12 um, FMP P to U, we do have at least one nonfiction article to anchor our work, sometimes more. And so we always start um, with the nonfiction article so that they have that base going in. And so we did the nonfiction article. And after the nonfiction article, I gave them their comp intro, what we are focusing on. And here it was relationships. And then they read chapters one to three, and then they did their brief summary. That's what we got to in day one. Day two was when I picked up with the language warm up, specifically vocab and context. Uh, I gave that comp intro in 30 seconds. And then they reread, just like the other group, they reread the same chapters in order to answer the focus question. And so again, I'm going to say to people who are looking in your reference book and you're looking at the structure guide or the comp guide, what we can typically do in one day in, in our classroom, we can do in two days over the computer. Um, you know, part of that is just because we're going to ha be having them read on a screen a lot of times, um, but also just because on a virtual situation, everything slows down. Now, what are we going to see video of? We're gonna see video of the nonfiction article. We are going to see the brief summary because I want us to see how we facilitate the brief summary. It's very different than how we facilitate a group summary, um, you know, in at the levels uh, in and below. And then we're gonna see the language warm up. We're gonna go ahead and see the vocab in context. The focus question here was facilitated um, very similarly to the focus question with Francine. So it's not really necessary to watch that. If we have time, I'll show you how I'm using more technology with this group than I was the group before. Okay, let's start with the nonfiction article. So the guiding questions, what do you think of, is effective? How do you want to adapt? And then still thinking about the safety, the affirmation, and the struggle. And if um, you could keep putting comments into the chat. I think that's really helpful. You guys are getting old enough that when we read fiction, there's a lot of things happening. And so many times we need to read nonfiction to understand what's happening in fiction. And remember, nonfiction is real, true facts, and fiction comes from the author's imagination, right? So we're gonna start by reading a nonfiction article to help us understand our fiction book. Cool? Cool. Cool, okay. Let me share it with you. Okay. So this article is called Understanding Autism, okay? And so you know what to do, take your time with it. And when you're finished with this part, go ahead and put a thumb up, but take your time. It's called Understanding Autism. Does anybody feel like they could answer that question? What is the autism spectrum? Okay, good, then this is a great habit in nonfiction. Let's go back and reread this very first part and let's see if we can get it into our own words, okay? So go ahead and take a look and um, reread the first three paragraphs, okay? Let's try this again. Okay? Remember when we understand something, we're able to put it into our own words. So let me just start with this. Autism is something that. Who could go ahead and take a first try? Jack, go ahead, sweetheart. And go ahead, nice and loud, please. Order is your brain cannot function right. Okay, good. Autism is something that affects your brain and is that what you said, sweetheart? Yeah. 
Okay. And your brain doesn't, he said, function normally. Okay. Okay, great. Does anybody, well, first let's just ask this. What do you guys think about what Jack said? Okay, everybody agrees. Does anybody want to add anything more about autism? Autism is something that... Lily, go ahead, sweetheart. I have a hard time reading other people's feelings. Mm, okay, fantastic. So autism is something that affects your brain and your brain doesn't function normally. It can be hard to... What'd you say, Lily? It can be hard to read people's feelings and talk to other people. It can be hard to read people's feelings and to talk to other people. Now, okay. let's look at what we wrote when we put it into our own words and let's see if there's evidence for it, okay? So something that affects your brain, your brain doesn't function normally, it can be hard to read people's feelings and to talk to other people, it can be hard to do activities. So let's see if there's evidence for that. So if you see a piece of evidence that can support that, go ahead and put your thumb up. Jack read this piece of evidence Children who have autism often struggle to know what others are thinking or feeling. What does that prove in our answer? That proves what? Lily, what does it prove? It can be hard to read people's feelings and talk to, talk to other people. Great. So that is, we have evidence for what Lily said. We have evidence for what Jack said. Now we have to see if there is evidence for it can be hard to do activities. So let's check to see if there's any evidence. Go ahead and give me a thumbs up if you think you know. Okay, Zoe, what piece of evidence do you have? Dealing with changes like trying new foods, having a substitute teacher, or, or schedule change. Great, and so why did you pick that for it can be hard to do activities? Because that's like an action that would be hard for them to do. Well, fantastic. So then, uh, Zoe, go ahead and add on. It can be hard to do activities like? Like changing to do different things. Great. Meeting new people. Let's talk about what we just did, okay? To make sure that we understood, we started to put what we learned into our own words. And then as we put it in our own words, we had to check to make sure there was really evidence for what we were putting into our own words. That was an excellent job. And now we understand what autism is, or at least a little bit more than we did before. So that's great. Now go ahead and think about something that surprised you in the article or something that you still have a question about. So I'm gonna actually give us 10 seconds here. You can answer either one, what surprised you or what you have a question about or both. So everybody take the time and kind of think right now. now we did a wonderful, wonderful job. This was, we were reading that nonfiction article. We talked about in our own words, what we understood and what we learned. And then we started to get into those surprised and questioning. And that's the way that we wanna read nonfiction and interact with nonfiction. And the great thing is, I know you guys have access to tablets and computers. And so these are some things that you could look up today. You could really just look up about autism. Why is it hard to get to know somebody? Um, why is it hard to eat new things? Lily, you could search a little bit more on brain development and autism and what's happening. And then you guys can be able to read more and understand more. So that was really great. So now we can go into... Okay, anything that you found effective, go ahead and put that into the chat. And then I have to say one thing. I did not notice while I was teaching, but I was watching it for the first time last night, and I had that, oh, not normally. That's not the word that I would have wanted to use if I was more thoughtful and reflective. I would have wanted to use that um, the brain is developing in a different way, you know, something different, not that it's not normal. And so I'm going to follow up with that group, but not my best moment, and I want to acknowledge that. Um, but as far as instructional techniques go when thinking about nonfiction, because I know with lifelong readers, we haven't done a lot of development with the nonfiction piece. We've kind of put it in there and said, let's try out this protocol and see how it goes. So 
um, I would say that the protocol that we've come up with is always these three things, which is you put what you've read into your own words, whatever is most important, whatever term is most important, you put it into your own words. That's the best way we can know if somebody is comprehending something when they reading when they read nonfiction to paraphrase it to use their own words. Uh, and then we check the evidence to see if our paraphrase works or not, or if we need to change some things about it. Um, from there, okay, we understand what we read. Now let's get into things that surprised us or questions that we have. We always want our nonfiction to be a springboard to something else. We don't ever want the article to be finished with one thing. We want to be thinking and questioning and then go out and do more research and thinking and talking. Um, we want to spur our children's curiosity. So let me go ahead and see what is in the chat. So let me see here. Okay. So Angela was pointing out that the content was engaging, that the children wanted to know what autism was, what the uh, uh, the spectrum was. And then um, uh, Shelby's asking, though, do you give any guidance on... Um, whether to use Google, whether to use something else, search terms, things like that. I've learned with my middle school groups that search terms are really hard for children. I thought this middle school group that I was working with that we were doing discrimination against Japanese Americans, I thought they'd know the search terms right away. They had no idea. They were just going to literally put like a paragraph into the search term. So I would say less important than browser is um, to know the keywords that you want to search for and telling them to put four kids, right? So you do whatever you say, four kids, four teens, and then it's going to begin to bring up the content that will be on their reading level and then also just on their maturity level as well. Um, Kimberly's pointing out again, highlighting the screen, you know, really being specific about what we're doing, where we're going back to find the evidence is not only a strong instructional technique, but it's keeping their engagement. And then Angela is pointing out that the action item um, at the end is really effective, that it doesn't stop here, um, that we can continue to think on the material and learn more. And it's, uh, you know, I would add on to Angela, we want the kids to be independent. We want them to have agency and kids have nothing but time now. They just have, you know, and, and as I talk to all these kids across grade levels, what do you say? How are you bored? You know, what did you do? Homework, video games. And so what we've done with our middle school group, but I think you do in grades three to five is people optionally say they're going to research something and they know their terms. They go research it and then the next day they bring it back and each kid gets a minute or two. And what that's done, especially in our middle school group, is when the first time only one child did it. And then the next time a few more and a few more. And now most children are doing something and presenting something to us. Great. We will keep it moving. So um, the brief summary, let's go into that. Same questions and same group, and this is still the same day. You just said, okay? So Zip, remember to keep it short, focus on the big ideas. Those are the two things I want you to do right now. Um, couple sentences, go ahead. Okay, so he looked in the refrigerator to find some food, and his favorite food was vanilla yogurt, but there was no vanilla yogurt, because his sister ate the last one, and he was and he was not happy about that, so he slammed the refrigerator door. Great, okay. So that time, uh, Lily, did uh, Zoe keep it short? Yeah. Yep, and did she focus on the big ideas? Yeah. She did, okay, great. Let's keep it moving. After his next back to his room and he felt comfortable about um, 
You're nailing it. He felt comfortable? He felt comfortable about his room? Yeah, he felt comfortable in his room. Great. So, Lily, did he keep it short? Yeah, he did. And there's not a lot of big ideas, so he really did cover it. All right, Cecilia, chapter three. Okay, so let me pause you still. Um, do you see? So here we have about 36 words. Here we have about 15 words. And here we have 55 <laughs> words, okay? So you're doing a great job, but which? what do you got to do, sweetheart? Keep it short. So just in a sentence or two, just tell me what happened, sweetheart. Okay, so Lily, what do you think about this? Um, she wasn't at the store. She was just staying right at the vet. Okay, so let me just see. Do you agree with this part? Yeah. Okay, and then you disagree with this part. All right, so we just got to find evidence, okay? This is perfect because if you disagree, no problem at all. You just find evidence. So all we do is go in here and see why she was late. Was she late because she went to the store or was she late? Um, like what Lily said, she went to the office. So put a thumb up when you see the evidence that answers that question. Did you go to the grocery store and get water and yogurt? I didn't have the time, Mom said. Okay. Good. And then, so, uh, so was she at the store? No. No. Good job fixing it. Um, and then, is there any evidence that she was at the office? Go ahead, Lily. Um. But then mom said it was because of an animal, a baby animal. Okay, and that tells you what, Lily? That she was at the vet. Good job. So Cecilia and Lily together, you guys figured out that we needed to switch this based on the evidence. So she was at the office because... Okay, a few thoughts here. So the first is that in the very beginning, this might be hard for kids because they don't really know how to go from these longer summaries um, that they build as a group to being really quick with it, right? And just thinking about why we're being really quick with it is that the depth is not in the sequence of events. The depth is in the character and their interactions and the theme. And so, again, this is pretty basic. He didn't get his yogurt. He's mad. Uh, he goes in his room. He's relaxed. And then his mom comes home and uh, she was late, right? That's pretty much what happened. So a couple of things to say. If after um, a few lessons, we're really not getting there, like this is taking too long, they're not getting it, um, the text might be too high. Um, it's not that you need to go back to that full retail because they've been able to do that full retail. So you might just have to scale back the text. The other thing is um, if a child is an outlier, meaning they struggle with this, but everybody else doesn't, this might not be their level. So in this case, I actually knew Cecilia was not on everybody else's level because she's younger. She's actually in second grade. And so she was being a part of this group when she's um, an OP reader. Um, a step 11, 12 reader, this was a level R. So that's definitely just a jump for her that's going to be difficult. Um, let me see what came in. So one question that came in um, was just asking, is this distracting for kids? We're toggling between a lot of things. We're showing. I would say um, if we're fast with it, if we um, if we know our shortcuts, if we know how to get back and forth, if we know what our tools are, I would say not at all. And in some ways they're more engaged. Like they're, they're really interested in all this and they love when you type out their words and they love when you put their evidence in, you put their name on the screen, they really like it. And all the highlighting keeps them engaged. When it takes us a long time, they're definitely going to check out. And I would say, so we learn our tools, but just know that after, you know, maybe days one and two, you're really slow with your tools and your technology. 
by days three and four, you're going to be fine. So um, yeah, that's what I would say there. And something I said in the K1 and 2, if we get a schedule up where we are meeting with our kids regularly and they are coming regularly, that's the win. That is absolutely the win. These times are crazy, unpredictable. We know all of those things. And so if we're able to have a few live classes with our kids every week, that is going to just greatly um increase um you know their all of the different metrics of reading and their enjoyment because they get to be with their friends as well and then let me see i want to make sure i don't miss anything and then okay okay i think i got it okay so i have a question about emily can you speak to the summaries provided in a lifelong learners lesson plans that are longer compared to what students did today great point um, I think that maybe we need to make a revision, right? I don't want to ever justify something that I think maybe isn't right. Um, so I think that our summaries are, are pretty good from up until step 10, which is the level in, I think, um, because especially up to step 10 level in, they're building a group retail. And I've always said it's, it's, it's an exemplar. If kids get 70%, you know, somewhere around 70% of what's in the exemplar, not not in those words, but sort of more generally. Um, Kathy, I think they need to be revised. I think that needs to happen. And I think that's something that we could do. And what we could do is kind of do a side by side. I'm glad you asked this because we never thought about it. We could do a side by side and we could have um, a detailed summary for the teacher because sometimes we can't read every page of every chapter book we have. And then we say what we expect a short summary to have. So I think that would be a good revision. So I'm gonna write it down. And I think it's not too, um, I think it could be manageable. So, um, great, let's keep it going. Um, what is the balance between you typing their answers and students writing their thoughts? Is there a time for them to synthesize their thoughts and write? Yes, we're gonna see that in this group. We're gonna see how they use the chat feature on their own so that they can do, so that they can write. Um, great quick clarity on who does what in the retails. Basically, up until the step 10 level in, we're doing a full group retail. And then as soon as we hit step 11 and 12, OP and above, we're doing short brief summaries only because that's not where the depth is anymore. And great, great. Okay, fantastic. Let's keep it moving. So, um, Shelby, would you mind to type your shortcut again for Windows or for PCs, whatever it is, and then I'll bring it over. Thank you. All right, here's where we're headed. Um, the language warm up. So this is the vocabulary in context. And so if you're doing this about every other time you meet with your group, I think that's a wonderful use of your time. So let's go ahead in there. Please write anything you think is effective with this. of the first step. Jack, remind us of the first step. Great. Yeah. Okay, so Cecilia, you get to decide what that means, how much you want to read, one sentence, two sentences, three sentences. Go ahead, sweetheart, and read all around the word muffling. And if Jamie's old earmuffs happened to make an outstanding muffling device, was it that funny if he likes to wear them okay great does anybody want to read any more or does do we think that that covers it jack what are you thinking um i think that covers it okay great let's go ahead here number two uh lily go ahead and read it figure out the feeling of the word and sometimes we can do this, sometimes we can't. But you kind of think, oh, does this feel really positive? Is this a positive moment? Ooh, is this a negative? Or kind of neither one, it's just a bit neutral. And so here's how we'll do this. When you hear the word muffling, I'm gonna ask you just a second if you think it's positive, if you think it's negative, or actually it's just kind of neutral. Okay, go ahead and show me. Okay. So we think it might be a positive word, okay? So we'll go with that for now. And if we have to revise it later, we can do that. Now, uh, Jack, number three. Try to replace it with a word or words that make sense. Okay, 
So we have to go back in here. And as you look in here, in your mind, you try and replace the word muffling. It can be with one word, it can be with a lot of different words, okay? Cecilia, read us the context again. Read us what you read. And if Jeannie's old earmuff happen, earmuffs happened to make an outstanding muffling device, was it funny that he liked to wear them? Okay, think about what you think muffling could mean. Okay, let me know when you have an idea. Okay, one idea is, two ideas. Jack raised his hand. Okay, cool. Um, let's try, you guys all know how to use the chat box? Yeah. Okay, so go ahead into the chat box. Okay, don't hit enter yet, but just put what you think muffling might mean. Okay? No enter yet. We're going to enter at the same time. So, Jack, while you write your idea, I'm going to ask Lily a question. I think this might help Cecilia. Um, Lily, I think there's like a little bit more context or a little bit more we could read to yes. understand this word. Okay. Uh, Lily, read what you think. Add the context or the sentences that's gonna, that, that will help us. That sensitive, sensitive hearing, for one, he didn't like loud sounds. What was so unusual about that? Good, and then go ahead and keep reading what Cecilia read. And if Jamie's old earmuffs happened to make an outstanding muffling device, well, was it that funny if he liked to wear them? Great, so what Lily just did um, is that she added on to number one, where we read all around the word or we use, um, we, we get the context. So Cecilia gave us good context and then Lily gave us more context. Um, we think it's a positive word so far, and now we're trying to replace it. Yes. Okay, so if you are ready, go ahead and hit enter, please. Okay, check. Okay, we'll go down here. Okay, good. So, can you guys see my chat box, or can you see your own chat box? Uh, yeah. Okay, great. So, um, great. So, one idea if Cecilia's is it's it means, and I like this because you don't have to have a perfect definition. She says, you know, something about, means something close to, and then I'll put this quiet. So Cecilia's like, it means something about quiet. It might mean to block out noise. And then I'm just gonna put it like this, block out noise. And that's a different idea. Okay, and then now it something something close to awesome. Okay, so I'll do that in a different one. Do that in blue. Okay, fantastic. So now what we do is we do this. We replace it. We go ahead and replace it with these things and we see what makes right. sense. So here we go. And if Janie's old earmuffs happen to make an outstanding, and then I'm gonna use this first one, quieting device, what was so funny to wear them, okay? Let's try the next one. And if Janie's old earmuffs happen to make an outstanding uh, device that blocked out noise, was it funny if he liked to wear them, okay? And the last one is, and if Janie's old earmuffs happened to make an outstanding, awesome device, was it that funny if he liked to wear them? Okay. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to tell me which ones you think makes the, you know, are the closest and which ones you think maybe aren't. Okay. Looking at the context. So, Jack, let me start with you. What do you think about these three? Quiet makes the most sense. You think quiet makes the most sense? Okay. Um, so Jack, um, Jack thinks this one. Any others or just quiet? Just quiet? Jack. Jack, can you? 
I said, you don't have to pick just one. Do you want to pick just one or any others make sense? Um, yeah, that, um, that's the one. Yeah. yeah, okay, cool. Cecilia, which ones do you think make the most sense? Blockout noise. Blockout noise. Okay. Cecilia. Okay. Lily, what do you think? And oh, sorry, Cecilia, just that one or another one too? Uh, just that one. Okay. And then Lily, what are you thinking? I kind of think quiet air blockout noise. Okay, great. Lily. Lily, good. Okay, cool. So we'll go take that one out. Great idea. And then. Okay, great. Bringing us back together. So I'll read a few things in the chat box and then I'll add a few comments. So a few different people, um, Kimberly and Shelby um, pointed out that that enter at the same time is key, right? So you have to really give that thought time and everybody's got to go at the same time. Um, Ebony is pointing out that the pacing was strong and that um, part of that was because there was really good economy of language. And then, um, yeah, so I think that kind of covers the, the trends there. What I, wanna, what I wanna say that I've said before is that vocabulary and context, like comprehension, is a process, not a product. And so any time thing is a straight memorization, if you have anything in life that you have to straight memorize, it's about the product. Did you get it memorized, right? That's what's most important. But when it comes to these more complex skills like like vocabulary and context, like comprehension, it's process based. That means it's a win if they get it right or they get it wrong if they did the process. So this clip, they happen to get it right or at least two out of three. And then they were able to come to a consensus. But let's say they all just kind of just bombed it. Right. I'd go through the same thing. And then I'd say at the end, friends, we went through the process and that's awesome. Today we didn't get it right. That's okay. Sometimes I can't figure out the vocabulary words and I try and I don't get it, but I'll just keep trying. And that's what a good reader does. Um, and then if you have a little bit of feedback for them. So, you know, friends, I think we didn't get it because you only read one line of context. And I think you actually needed to read the paragraph, right? Or whatever your feedback may be. But just remember all of this, the comprehension, all of this is a process. Did kids get to practice what matters most? Did they get to practice finding evidence, paraphrasing what they learned, all these things? It doesn't mean they did it correctly, but they got practice with that process. And then over time, which is different for every child and adult, we start to make progress in those areas. Great. Um, okay. What I'm gonna do right now, just still time for questions, I'm gonna skip the one that's on technology and say that it'll be on the YouTube channel. And so I'm basically showing how this group puts in a first answer to the focus question, and then we see which one is the strongest, and the other kids get a chance to revise theirs, and they put in a second answer. So I do that with our um, like step 11 and 12, O and up. It's not something I necessarily do below that, but we do get a chance, not every day, but sometimes to put those, to put two possibilities in. Okay, so closing thoughts. This is actually an incredible time to learn how to teach guided reading. Uh, strangely enough, it's much easier to learn over the screen. You don't have to manage kids. You don't have 30 kids in your classroom. And typing stuff out is much faster than charting. You don't have to get all your visuals everywhere. You just switch back and forth. Um, I, you know, as I've been teaching this, I'm like, wow, we could really get better at our guided reading facilitation and our understanding of how to do this by teaching virtually, um, because I believe it is easier. And so just kind of keep that in mind that we right now, not just it's not just about our kids. It is, of course, about our kids um, growing and um, continuing to grow. But it's also about our own growth. And so, for example, I have a middle school group. I've never taught middle school. I'm just going to keep meeting the middle school once a week so that I can get better at reading instruction in middle school. And I'm, I'm really excited about that. Um, the other thing I would say in closing is just about community. We... Uh, Almost always in life when we have a tragedy or we have something really difficult that we're going through, we have a community. And right now we don't have that, um, not at least physically. And so I do think these class meetings are 
just as important is the community that we're building and, and seeing our kids and having that interaction. And so I would really push and say, try as much as possible to get some of those live classes in. And let me go ahead into, I wanted to recommend a few books. These are um, fantastic books. Uh, if you, you know, if you don't have a lot of time right now, young adult books are great. The Giver is a quartet series. I think it's maybe the, some of the best books I've read alongside Harry Potter. And then this is just a new author that I found that I absolutely love. The books aren't depressing and they're kind of in an entirely different world. So that's um, refreshing. And resources and staying connected. Everything is going on the YouTube channel. Um, you just have to search lifelong readers. Everything we do and we're going to keep putting new video up. We're not going to do the middle school webinar, but we are going to put the middle school uh, footage up there. Um, everything on Twitter, we're going to try and put any new resources that we're creating on Twitter. We're very new to Twitter, so figuring that out. And um, the, the online portal, if you haven't already signed up, it's, it's free to everybody right now, every teacher, every educator, every parent. And what it will give you access to is all those vocabulary cards. You can share your screen and use them. And then, of course, the phonics stuff is there as well. Um, if you're looking for a link to enroll in that, you can just put it at the bottom of our um, website page that you'd like that link. Okay, so now is time for the questions. And we got about 13 minutes, I think, which is going to be good. And let me just go ahead back to, it was um, Kathy and it was Lauren who were talking about how do we get books to kids. And I actually wrote some notes on my phone. Um, so I want to give some ideas. But before I give ideas, I, I, I do want to say teaching at a high level in grades three to five is possible if kids have no text and they have no written responses. You know, they bring scrap paper to the table and then it's totally possible and you can get some really strong lessons in. And in some ways, I, I, I prefer that, but I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit later. But so here are some of the thoughts that I had on how we get um, books to kids. Um, the first is we mail them. And I, if you have the budget, if you and, and individual teachers, please don't spend your money on books. That's not that's not what you should do. But school leaders, if you have it in your budget, it is it is going to be the best investment of your money. Why? Because research, one of the things that we know is that kids who are strong readers have tons of books in their house. Yes, that is equivalent to wealth as well. So I see a lot of things that are going there. But it's always good for a child to have another book. They read it. Their sibling reads it. They go back to it. So and, and that would also increase investment because the kid gets it. And all the books in our curriculum are four dollars on Amazon. So that's one idea. Um, Another idea is Kindle books. I mean, you don't have to have a Kindle to read Kindle books. You just have to download the Kindle app, which is free. And then you um, would, would buy them the Kindle book. That's just as expensive as a physical book, but it's a little bit safer right now in terms of everything that's going on. Um, another thing, I don't, this is a bit of an ethical issue, but right now I would put this ethical issue to the side. You could buy the Kindle version, you screenshot it, you put it into a PDF and you send that via email to parents. Um, and then the other thing is this, this would take a little bit of organization, but there are um, almost all counties and cities and states have public libraries where all you do is get a free account and you can check out a book for two weeks. And you could teach, um, you know, the, the child or the family how to get on and do the same thing. And everybody would have an electronic version. They also have open source libraries that aren't tied to a specific county that you just put your stuff in and you can get those books as well. Those are our ideas on how to get books. What I would say is if your kids have access to independent reading books and they're doing independent reading, it's perfectly fine if they're not doing guided reading ahead of time. They can just come. The thing that's hard about guided reading is if one child doesn't do the work, they can't participate. And in our classrooms, it's different because we see them do the work. And that's going to be difficult. If half the kids do it and half the kids don't, you're going to have to repeat it. And then it kind of says to the kids who did it ahead of time, hey, why did I do this? So my recommendation would be find a way to get your kids independent books um, in any of the methods that we talked about. And then just go ahead and teach guided reading on a screen. 
Um, or, you know, you could do it on a screen and they could have physical books as well. Um, but again, even skimming to find text is possible electronically like we saw. Okay, please go ahead and put any additional questions you have in the chat. Um, let's see what we have right now. Okay. Um, okay, so this is just kind of a question in general. How are you ensuring that students attend weekly? I don't have any systems for that, um, just because I've been doing these sort of one-offs with our lifelong reader schools and the principal sets up the kids, or I'm using my old students and I'm getting all their parents in. But I will say that, and so please, anybody who has um, sort of systems to invest families and kids, if you'll put them in the chat, I'll bring them over. I will say what I have found, especially when I'm, I'm literally going back to kids that I had in kindergarten and they're now in middle school. That's my middle school group, kids I had in kindergarten. And their parents are pumped. Everybody's pumped. The kids are pumped. The parents are pumped. The parents are pumped because they don't have to deal with their kid for an hour, right? And they're happy they're learning, but really they don't have to deal with their kid for an hour. And then the group is pumped because they get to see each other and they get time to talk in the beginning and the end. And then in kindergarten, what I'm seeing, people are doing virtual show and tells. They're doing hat day. They're doing pajama day. They're saying, if you have a pet, bring it to your group today and trying to keep things as fun as possible. I think it's only realistic to say that if we can get between 60 to 75 percent of our kids engaged, that that is a really, really good goal. And then for that 25 to 40 percent that's not engaging, we have to kind of aggressively go after kids who are vulnerable, whether they, we have disabilities or they're significantly below grade level. And we have to kind of, you know, do anything we can to help them get access to technology or Wi-Fi or any of those types of things. Um, great question. Thanks, Megan. And um, go ahead. Any final questions? We got seven minutes left. Anything at all? I am learning a ton as I do this. I, I, um, these times are terrible and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sorry if I didn't highlight that enough and I do hope everybody is doing well and it is, it is crazy and it is scary. Um, I do think a silver lining is staying connected with our kids and getting better. I'm just, you know, isolated of everything else when I teach. I'm so happy. I'm so happy when I teach. I'm so happy when I see their faces. I'm so happy when we work through something difficult. And I'm so happy. I'm getting better as a reading teacher. Um, and it's this chance to really get like a one of these developments when sometimes our development feels a little bit more like this. Um, so I think these and then I would encourage, you know, I always encourage school leaders, principals, every single person teach, teach, teach. If you want to be an expert, teach. If it's 20 minutes a week, if whatever you have, you will be a better teacher or better leader at anything if you teach. It all comes down to teaching. Um, okay, I'll do um, a final call for questions. And let's go. Here we have one. Okay. No, please, Kathy, all the questions. Bring them. Okay, so, which is awesome. Are there chapters also available? Let me see this. Okay, so let me make sure I understand. So um, the plans that we have are aligned to books we can find in Reading A to Z, which is awesome. Are the chapter books also avail available there or is there something you may not? Okay, so the way that I do it is um, I just buy the Kindle version and the Kindle version of a book is typically about $4. And so for Francine and for um, Bat, I just bought the Kindle version. And if I'm sharing my screen, I'm the only one that has to ha have that. So that's really affordable. Um, and it's going to last me for four to six weeks each group. That's something definitely every school can work. Kindle's really nice because of the ability to color code different sections. And it's also nice because it's a swipe, you know. So it looks like a book. It's swiping page to page. I really like the Kindle if you're going for something electronic. Okay. Still have five minutes. Um, anything else? I took some notes too on like written responses and how to be creative with written responses. So um, Google Forms is good if, you know, if people aren't using it. It's a way um, you can even put like videos of lessons and different things in there and then everything comes and it's easy. So one, you know, just to explore Google Forms. 
one idea is just take a picture and email it or text it. And if you get this set up with families um, and the kids can't really use chat, the chat feature, because they don't, it can't type fast enough, they, everybody could have scrap paper and they write their thoughts and take a picture, send it to you, text it, email. Those are possibilities. The chat feature is fantastic if kids can, you know, write fast enough. And um, yeah, those are those are the thoughts that I had around written responses. Um, and I guess I'm going to repeat myself because I think it's so important. We underestimate independent reading all of the time, all of us. We spend all of our time on the curriculum for phonics and shared reading and this and that, read aloud vocab, all these things, they matter. But independent reading is as important or more important. It's one of like the one metrics that there's tons of studies. It's like, that's what matters actually more than anything, more than um, the curriculum, more than the assessment, more than the time in the school day is how much a child is independently reading. And independently reading is all about getting kid a book on their level that they're interested in. And if kids have a book, their own book that, they're, that they like and they're interested in, they'll read it. The other really good research out there um, is around long form books. Everything is telling us that a steady diet of short articles does nothing long term for anybody's comprehension. That real comprehension is in long form. It's in books. And then we have a, a small diet of shorter pieces. But we got to have our kids really have the book. Okay, great. We have three minutes. Um, we still have most people here. So anything at all, I'll give us about 10 or 15 seconds. Anything um, that's on your mind, I'm so happy to help with. Okay, I think we're good. Um, this webinar and all of the videos from this webinar will be up on Monday. And so um, that link will be there. I'm sorry, it'll be on the YouTube channel. You can go there. And again, just stay stay connected with us. Um, you know, we want to help in any way we can. The online portal is open, the YouTube channel, the Twitters, all that. We want to help um, however we can. And I think that's the end of the questions. So please, please have a wonderful, safe weekend and let us know if there's anything that we can do to help. Bye, everybody.